Say it right. You are watching Talking Hardcore with George and Scott. All right, we have a new intro. This is Talking Hardcore, the podcast for people who love hardcore history. We can skip the boring to the interesting stuff. Worst person in the world in history, Genghis Khan. So you can tell us about your ancient Mongol relatives and all that kind of stuff, right? Okay. I think we all have ancient Mongol relatives, don't we? <laughs> Thanks yeah. to Genghis Khan. <laughs> Probably. I just don't know him. Okay. <laughs> anyway, you guys ready? I'm ready. All right. Right on. You're watching Talking Hardcore. I'm George. I'm Scott. And we have with us today... Uh, Matt Bella. Author and uh, history buff. <laughs> fan of history. How about that? Author and That's fan it. of history. Uh, just like us, a uh, huge fan of hardcore history. If you saw our earlier episode, we talked to Matt. Uh, we did an interview with him um, just about how he fell in love with hardcore history and and uh, about his writing. And then today he's here to do one of our regularly scheduled episodes where we talk about an old hardcore history episode. Yep. Step stories, right? Yep. Step stories. And then the hardcore addendum that came out recently uh, more stories from the step uh, that Dan did with um, what was the author's name? Matt, do you remember the author's name? I was listening to it today and I can't remember his name. <laughs> That's okay. This this is this is not something people should come to for actual hard facts. This is more about themes of history and interesting discussion <laughs> because I don't remember his name either. Oh no. Uh, now I'm trying to look. Well, I'm terrible with names. So anyway, I find the step. A fascinating branch of history. I don't know, Matt. What about you? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, just as compelling as Dan makes it out to be. Yeah, Wrath of Khans is probably my favorite. That or Death Rose. And we're not going to get into Wrath of Khans today. Today is more generic step story stuff. We're saving Wrath of Khans till we're better at this podcasting stuff. Yep. You know, another another thirty episodes, twenty episodes, we get to Wrath of Cons. We're gonna be good at this. <laughs> I feel like I, I just find the the step the the step method of uh, societal societal development like within their culture just very fascinating. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, you you'd have the great con, and he'd be you know drinking out of a wooden cup, and you know had a cloak full of mud, you know. Uh, my skins you know he, uh-huh. everybody else enjoyed the riches and here he is just, you know living like a pauper still that's the that's the a, famous story of attila yeah that's a good lesson for leadership yeah no yeah. joke right yeah okay really so is. so just a little more breakdown episode 12 of hardcore history in in the old episodes which you can get from dan's website uh he did one of his first, it might be the second one that talks about step peoples, maybe the third or first, um, where he just goes over basically generic stories from the step. He doesn't focus on one group of people, just things about step peoples that fascinate him. And then in the addendum, he had that author on who talks about his recent book. Uh, uh, histo- historian Kenneth W. Harrell. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> that was right on the tip of my tongue. And he wrote a book about the step that just came out recently. So we talked to Dan and they got into a few things that I didn't know about step peoples. But and I yeah. still don't know. <laughs> Scott hasn't, <laughs> hasn't got a chance to listen to it yet. So we thought it would be perfect because then he gets to genuinely react to the information that uh, Matt is going to throw at us a lot here, I think. So huh. Matt, when you listen to step stories first, we'll go with the hardcore history original episode. <laughs> What kind of stands out to you? What fascinates you about the steppe people? I, I think that their feature is a specialized warrior um, as a product of their environment, the steppe being conducive to not only the maintenance and evolution of the horse, but also to the people who live there and developed around the horse. And it just seems like this breeding ground for an elite warrior that literally took the world by storm, not only right. famously with, with Genghis Khan and the Mongols, but throughout history, as is related in Step Stories, the original episode with the Huns and the Scythians. Right. People. One of those concepts that came up in the original Step Stories that I wanted to talk to you guys about was this idea of the womb of nations, right? 
So I was reading this article that you shared on the Discord, Matt, um, cool. a- about uh, the people in Tuscany who their ancient DNA, they believe, came from the steppe. Do you remember that article you shared? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool, huh? Yeah, and it, it – so I started thinking about that, and then you think about – Attila and causing the fall, the pushing the Germans and causing the fall of the the Roman Empire and all that. And you're like, how long has this process been going? This had that been going before gunpowder, like the the womb of nations in the deep in the heart of the steppe, just creating these these hard tribes, forcing the set the slowly just working its way out, getting pushing everybody further and further from the steppe to the point where they made it to Italy probably 5,000 years ago, or maybe it was even 20,000 years ago this was still going on. Mm. Like the ancient DNA shows that people have always been moving constantly, right? True. But you look at these womb of nations like the Vikings, the Scandinavians, and the, and the, and the steppe peoples, and those hard people from those times or from those hard places – really impacted everywhere which is interesting i mean which is fascinating if you want to look at like an alternative history type uh (laughs) i just like battles like who would win you know the mongols or the vikings i'm assuming it's probably the mongols on land uh right but i I don't know if the mongols would fare very well on the sea so hey dude they probably fought we just don't we don't know possibly if you look at at least step peoples maybe not mongols right the steppe people have probably fought the Vikings at some point, somewhere. That is one thing that Dan talks about both in the original uh, Hardcore History ep- episode and in more steppe stories, the addendum. Mm-hmm. Where, and it's something that stood out to me just as fascinating, that the Mongols were fighting Japanese samurai in the east simultaneously <laughs> with Teutonic knights in the west. Yeah. And neither, neither of those people had any idea that the others existed at that time. <laughs> oh, you got to love it. Well, you have to think about the the breadth of the the Mongol Empire, or absolutely you know, the, where they were, you know, where they were cutting their teeth. I mean, yeah, it's basically the entire. Uh, no, let you just call it basically all of Asia, uh, <clears throat> you know, from the the borders from China or the shores of China all the way to you know Russia or Eastern Kazakhstan. Yep, all the yeah, way Eastern. Western to like what we consider provinces of the old Soviet Union. Yeah, Hungary, Georgia. Yeah, sure. right. They were fighting the Middle East. Don't... They were fighting knights, like you said, yeah. knights and samurai, like awesome. But then they probably that... did before that the steppe peoples, because the Vikings made it pretty far, right? Sure. They made it pretty far, more than we think about. They probably fought some, some horse archers, and they probably got their asses kicked. Probably, they... yeah. Well... Yeah, they they might have run into uh, Native Americans as well. I mean, there's they, Dude, they found sure. that is a fun concept. So at the same time that the Vikings might have been fighting, <laughs> or at least inter interacting with Native Americans, they were probably interacting with steppe people, who were also they... interacting, not that much longer later, with knights and <laughs> samurai. <laughs> so we think about how the world's getting smaller. We always, True. we always talk about that. We talk about how the world's shrinking, everybody getting smaller. And in a way, it really is. But that stuff was always there. But, yeah, well, but, nowadays, but go ahead. Sorry, Matt. Oh, no, ahead. Yeah, I like, I like that. Nowadays, the world is getting smaller because of telecommunications, but back then it was because of conquest. Right. Or trade. Trade, you know. And, and the Mongols definitely <laughs> helped establish all the Silk Roads and everything, uh-huh. that, you know. Yeah. I mean, you didn't want to be a criminal. If the penalty was that bad. True. And can I jump back to something you said about like how long ago they might have been doing these sort of migrations? Yeah. In the addendum episode, Dr. Harl does say – so one thing I've always really found interesting, getting into the steppe people through Dan, and then you think how long ago was the mm-hmm. horse domesticated? How long is the, have these right. specialized warriors – been bonding with this weapon vehicle companion mm-hmm. known as the horse right right and of course in america you had something like the horse but it was hunted to extinction and then you know eventually died out 
Um, but in, in the East, we have all these people we're talking about. And uh, I always put it, what I'd read before was about 1400 BC. Dr. Harrell put a f more firm number on it in the Indemnum episode. He said 2000 BC. And mm -hmm. then a thousand years later, like early Iron Age, um, uh, is when they moved to actual uh, riding. And prior to that, they were using chariots. So they right, didn't yep. ride first. Did they first develop chariots? Imagine that, like very the first primitive uh, horse warriors, right. because were the just horse towed around. Because the horse couldn't handle a rider, they weren't big enough, right? They yeah, had they to had, they yeah, had to breed sure, the sure. horse to get them. At least that's, that's one really of the point. theories I've heard, right? They that's had to point. domesticate the horse, breed it to be strong enough to carry a human. Whereas a chariot, you could have it was less weight. Because the weight was taken up by the wheels on the ground, like, or you and you have more, or you have multiple horses pulling a chariot instead. Exactly. That's but, a good point. And that kind of, when I think chariots, I think of the Iliad and stuff. Because back in when we have tales of the Bronze Age, we mm. find chariots and we don't know how people use them, right? Right. Um, Homer seems to have not known how the chariot was used because he just has people getting dropped off at the battles in them, right, rather than fighting in them. And that well, maybe was following, they were. maybe they were, but that was also following a large like loss of knowledge about that time, and they were picking right. things up, and sort of postulating how their own people did battle. And so right. when I think chariot, I think, well, that's a really good insight that it just kind of naturally developed first to be towed behind the horse, and you're just fighting on it. Sure. And then even if before the horse, right? So yes, that's what gave them the weapon system that allowed them to conquer. The horse and the and the bow, right, allowed them to conquer like they did. Right. But you got to figure that those people coming out of there were still way harder. But and so they probably weren't conquering as successfully. But I'm sure they were still somebody to mess with, right? I'm sure they were. I mean, somebody not to mess with. Sure. And they were probably still very successful and still forcing people out because the people in the middle, where it was the worst place to live were still the hardest and slowly forced Absolutely. it out. So those waves were probably happening, but they were probably happening slower, or smaller scale. True. And well, when you have someone coming in like Genghis and, you know, saying, everybody stop fighting. I'm your ruler now. We're all going to fight other people together. You know, that, that usually means that there has been a lot of infighting going on and they needed somebody to yeah. come in and settle things. Right. Well, there got... was there was still a lot of infighting until he pretty much killed anybody that was going to fight him, <laughs> sure. like fight against <laughs> him. Maybe you know once yeah. once you gather enough people to your side, oh man, you know, then that, you, then that... you can start making rules. That know? makes me think about the Romans. Quote the quote Dan always does with the Romans. They created a wasteland and called it peace. Yeah, I love that quote. Yeah. Oh, so good. But and one it thing is. I wanted to say, it's interesting to think about the chariot being used as the first like personnel carrier. I, I didn't. Right. I never thought of totally, it that way. Man. Yeah, well, I'm sure that's what it was too, right? At first, at first it was probably like, "Hey, we can get more armored troops to places faster, right?" Without wearing them right. out. Without and wearing them out, they'll be ready for battle, right? Totally. Because they're not all crazy Greeks that can just run. Yeah, in full armor, <laughs> like hoplites. Like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like at like, marathon. Right. And uh, we do have we uh, we do know that there were um, like in Mesopotamian cultures there were um, archers who fired fr who loosed arrows from their chariot, but they would have right. somebody like you know driving the horse for them, and then they'd be there kind of like right. a mobile a mobile so artillery platform, literally half yep. as effective, right? As, so because you're taking that, twice the manpower to do the same job, as if you exactly. can fire those if they're trained so well to fire those arrows while riding, which right. is in, have you ever, if you ever fired a bow, the <laughs> fact that people can hit anything at a full gallop or even a trot is impressive as hell. Well, and that's the other interesting, like, you know, Dan explains in Wrath of the Cons, but uh, maybe it was in Step Stories, too, where, you know, the, 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 the fighters would learn to, like, release their arrows as all four feet of the horse yep. were off the ground. That was so Wrath of the Cons. Yep. Yeah, Rath it's Cons, freaking right, fascinating, yeah. right? They, they train them to do that. Yep. Right so, at the moment when their feet are off the ground, so there's no disturbance to the to the the arrow being yeah. loose. One thing he talks about in step stories that you know I don't remember actually even encountering before is how much these people look like aliens. That is something I really wanted to talk about. 
good. The, Me too. Their appearance. Yeah. Yeah. Because every time yeah. the statue of Genghis, he doesn't look like a alien. They didn't do the whole head shaping. Had they stopped that by the time the Mongols mm. had had to join the scene? Had that kind of phased out as much, or were they still doing the head wrapping? Okay, to clarify for people just listening now or watching now, the the step people's part of their culture was to do uh, – excessive um head binding head binding other ways they would adapt their 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 looks to make themselves more fearsome right and a uh, facial scarification so they wouldn't grow beards right which but, is effed up and i really wonder and, about that too and they, i i'm sorry to cut you off Matt, but i remember no, no, no. uh dan saying that the mothers would start like an early age like as the kid children were like the when the when the kids were babies, like mm -hmm. they would start right. scarring the face so they wouldn't grow a beard. I wonder what the significance of that was. It was just a cultural, or maybe it's a resource thing. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, maybe they don't like. To... Hey, you need that the the energy that you're growing that beard. You need to put that into like <laughs> other places. You're, like, maybe physically... maybe we need to, maybe we we need to read Doctor uh, Harl's book and. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking about that. I mean, he, yeah. he's it's he seemed he seemed like the book he would write would probably be interesting. Some historians it's stuffy. Yeah. It, I it didn't got get Dan that. fired up and he, he has a passion for the subject and it's and he goes all the way back to prehistory all the way through Renaissance time, so it's got to be which, encyclopedic. Which I think would be fun as long as he yeah. can tell a story and not make it all about the dates. Well, totally, there's man. one. I I just I just googled it. But you know, you'd have something like Something That's like amazing. that. Think so about here's that. the deal, and, and and Dan expresses this in Step Stories, the, for the first one. Um, mm -hmm. The Romans encountering these people said they looked like stumps. Like they were short, they were squat, bow-legged from riding the horse, facial mm -hmm. scars, these these elongated skulls. I mean, imagine yeah. encountering that in, in just normal life, let alone in battle. That is terrifying, and terror was very much a part of of these people's oh, yeah. tactics. Now, you'll yeah. remember, you, George, you like death throes of the Republic. So Love you'll it. remember that um, Dan describes the meeting of the Romans with the first German people and how they were very scary because they were tall and they had this long, pale hair that they would right. wash with lime. And it they just were rolling that... around in the snow, naked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Just that yep. freaked out the Romans. Like, imagine right. the Huns looking oh, like yeah. that. Yeah, that's got to yeah. be terrifying. Literally combat. looking like an alien. Well, and another thing I remember, this isn't, I, I don't remember, I don't recall Dan ever mentioning this in any of the uh, podcasts about the uh, the Mongols uh, or the Huns, but they used, they made their armor out of leather. And then what they would do is to harden the leather if I remember correctly, they would take dung and wipe it on the leather and then dry it out and, and dry it in the <laughs> sun to harden it. Um, yeah. I know this wasn't in any of the episodes. No, I, I remember I this is from a while ago. Sure. I, I just cool. recall this. But not only did they look scary, but they smelled bad too. So, right. well, and, <laughs> yeah, there's uh, that thing. <laughs> yeah, in Wrath of Cons, uh, he talks about how. Um, That's what I was going to say. Yeah, right on. Uh, he talks about how. Uh, after they conquered um, certain portions of China, they were so rich they'd be wearing the finest silk clothes, but they were just rotting off of themselves, right? Because they didn't, they didn't believe in, they didn't have a culture of bathing. Yeah. Right. They wouldn't offend the water god or whatever. Well, and there then, was no um, freaking water out there. Yeah. Though. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, I mean, it was just it, <laughs> water was much not... more scarce. Sure. And then they would be eating the entrails of animals, but raw and not cleaning them out first. So yeah. just all together. I don't. I don't want to go too far down the word barbaric, but I mean, no, it's these fun. People, these Throw people it out there. They were barbarians. Ter terrifying in every aspect of their lifestyles. Like yeah. whether you were a captive, whether you were a diplomat, whether you were a combatant, like everything if about you, them was just scary. If you came from a soft civilization, these people were anything but that. They were sure. hard. They didn't. Yes have warm baths they had steams they didn't right they they made their clothes out of mouse fur they they were the stuff the boogeymen of the nightmares of all the settled societies they had to deal with them and mythology right? developed from their fighting style like the centaur exactly. man mentions that yeah they like oh. literally are these people horsemen like we don't know they seem to be one with this animal right they're half horse half man 
and that's that's interesting. And what, one of the things that I love about the step and talking about these the horse archers is I find it fascinating to to learn about when humans can specialize and get amazing at something. Me and too. it goes right all the way down to like making a throwing a fastball 105 miles an hour and hitting a target, Absolutely. right? Like Yep. That's the same ability to focus and skill set that the Mongols were able to do with horse archery. But Definitely. the difference is if you're not good at throwing a fastball, you're probably not going to die and starve. <laughs> but if you were shitty at riding this horse and shooting your bow <laughs> and shooting your bow, either that you would it. die in battle or they your buddies might just be like, Nope. Sorry, buddy, you're gone. We can't yeah. have this. You're the weakest yeah. link. Or when or when that guy goes into battle with his, you know, mm-hmm. his squad, he's the one that gets murked first. Right. You know? Yeah. It, yeah. Sure. It's funny. One thing I wanted to bring up, and I don't know if either of you two have seen this movie, it's called Furious. Um, it's a <laughs> Russian movie. 2017 it's it was kind of like a ripoff of uh of 300 really but, oh, yeah wow. but it was it's russians versus the mongols <laughs> nice. well they did that a lot yeah but, but then all the russians die like that's just well, how that's it pretty accurate movie. but okay. uh, it, they kind of had like that last stand where the guy there's one warrior left and of course he dies but uh fighting the rest of the mongol hordes off hmm. uh, but it, it was i remember watching that i think it was probably during COVID because I didn't have much to do, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's called Furious. It was 2017. So I don't know if anybody would be cool. able to find it or be interested in watching it. They did go above and beyond with like patriotism, Russian. patriotism. Uh, no, no, not so much. <laughs> it was more like uh, uh, they really, uh, and this might be historical Russian documentation. I don't know, but they kind of made like the, the Mongols or the Huns, almost like almost like a native american tribe they'd have like paint on and they would be wearing the silks and stuff like from from other uh you know um civilizations they'd conquered sure it was very huh. interesting very interesting movie um but, that's cool but you know, they didn't have the head binding or any of that i don't i don't recall yeah you'd remember yeah i don't think they did I feel like you'd remember if they had that and that that's like i'm saying like the stained statue of genghis the famous statue of Mongolia that is literally at the airport, the size of a sports stadium, <laughs> right? He doesn't look very no. weird. And he so also looks very just, not Caucasian. Right. That may be just a representation of their, you know, yeah. Like you know, the ideal yeah. figure or whatever. Right. There's it's also just, just a follow up uh, really cool, on movies. There's a, a, a movie called Mongol. That's about the early life of Genghis Khan. It has really? him as a yeah. It has him as a boy. It was made. It's made in by Mongolia. So I, I yep. it's producer over there. Um, has him as a boy. Shows him being uh, shows his father being poisoned by the poison milk from a rival tribe member. Um, him selecting his wife when he was young. Her being kidnapped. Him going through to rescue her. Like very very interesting stuff about his early life. Didn't that movie start out with they had to like hide him or or like take him away from the village or because so, they thought that he was going to be killed or. I, maybe I'm, I, I I'm think uh, so. misremembering. I'm going to have to check that out. It's been a while since I've seen it. Yeah, yeah it's I, a good I, one. I, I wanted to too. name our dog Tamujin, and I got over. <laughs> oh, it's a great name, man. <laughs> I'm like, no, nobody no. will know how awesome it is unless they yeah. know. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and the the one person who recognizes that name is immediately your friend. Yeah. So. Yeah, you're like, oh, yeah, Tamujin, that's awesome. You named him after Genghis Khan. Kind of like, now we're best friends. Well, what we're kind of like about... how I'm... Oh, go ahead. No, kind of like how I named my our Rottweiler as Athena. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Just, Instead, I named him about... Hank. <laughs> oh, well, that's Hank. <laughs> Not the same. <laughs> Hank. Hank's good, too. The guy who hey, murdered, Hank. like, the most people in human history. It's about the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hank in some foreign language may be just as terrifying. You never know. I'm going to say maybe Hank is the English version of Tamujin. Yeah, you never know. I, I'm going to tell people that because nobody can fact check that. <laughs> <laughs> interesting all right what were you yeah just just playing off the terrifying aspect of their person let's zoom out into the terror used as a weapon and as a tactic in battle right right one thing that dan delved into in the um in the addendum episode recently was and he 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 covers this in wrath of cons as well so let's just let's just really quickly do that terror as a weapon um he was talking about when he was in history class 
he had a, a Chinese uh, history teacher, not a teacher of Chinese history. A I history remember that. Was, right, right, right. And he submitted a paper on the military tactics of the Mongols, and he received a much lower grade than he was expecting to, right? And he said, what's going on here, Teach? And the guy said, well, you didn't take into account their brutal mass slaughter policies. And he's like, you have something personal going on. It's thousands of years, hundreds of years old, but it's like the paper wasn't, he goes, the paper wasn't about that. It was about the military tactics. He's right. Like, how and could you focus on that without taking into account the damage that those tactics wrought? Which made me think that the damage that those tactics wrought was in itself a strategy, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Ter terror, terror. And he elaborates on this with uh, Dr. Carl in, um, Right. Yeah, he did. And and, and, and yeah, he said. Uh, I'm sorry. It's Doctor Harl, not Carl. So he. he uh, yeah. Yes, so Carl sounds better. He, we're gonna it change does. it to Carl. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they, if you terrorize a city into submitting, you lose less warriors taking that city, and so they would drive the people in from the countryside to spread the word of their menace. Right? They would go mm -hmm. into the city and tell their rulers. Oh my God, literally the worst people in the world just came and killed everybody I know. They left me as a survivor. We have to surrender to these people. And then the actual army rolls up and they have all that work done for them and they just right. get to open the gates. Yeah, so that terror is a tactic. It is a tactic, but if if you remember what the, he said in that addendum episode as well, is, but it also seems like maybe they enjoyed it and you were really to, good at it. You, you have know. to train your warriors to enjoy it, yeah. you know, or else that's how you get them gonna... to be good at it, right? You're going to be right, good at right. terror if you enjoy it. You're not going to yeah. be good at it if you're faking it. Well, exactly. And then the, the other thing that really sticks out, you know, in my mind was the fact that, you know, the Mongols would go and sack a city or a town or whatever mm -hmm. and then go back three days later and make yeah. sure all the survive, like kill the rest of the survivors. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But how would we know if they did that if they really killed them all? <laughs> Somebody would have got away. They said, it, well, we're not staying in this city. We're out. That's my point. Like, I feel like they probably did do that. Yeah. But they probably also were like, like Matt said, make sure a few of these guys escape. Yeah. Because that's why it's worth that going back is worth the it if you're putting that fear of God into the next time. or Or you'd have a traitor. Mm -hmm. That would go and, okay, show up, and then everybody's dead. But you can tell some bodies were more decayed than other bodies, so clearly they have been well. killed yeah. later. I mean, or you never know. Talk, yeah. right? Or they just talked about it amongst themselves and passed it down. You know, Probably a little bit of all of those things. Probably a little bit of but all of those things. But if it's terror, you want you want some firsthand accounts. Yeah. Terror so, is usually – yeah. Terror, terror yeah, it just works unless, better. Right. Yeah. There is the kind – we are getting way into Wrath of Consdale, but there is the kind of terror – that comes it was from inevitable. The, the wasteland, like when they're talking about rolling up on the empty lands and the mountains of bones and the cities that are more spectacular than anything anyone could imagine engineering, and they're completely destroyed. So, yeah. Yeah, it was Kenneth Harl is the guy's name. <laughs> so one of the things – I made a note of this. One of the things he talks about in that addendum is that – he doesn't think that the horrors were exaggerated. He thinks sure. that there's too many accounts and too many disparate areas that were not connected for them to be exaggerated. Well, I have to agree. Yeah. I'm, once again, I don't see why they would be. Yeah, like, uh, I forgot the exact story, what happened, but, you know, when they, they built that, like, uh, platform on top of alive people uh -huh. and then we're sitting there <laughs> eating while everybody's uh -huh. slowly dying underneath them they ate dinner yeah and partied on a stage built on top of their enemies <laughs> alive that were still alive they're still alive well <laughs> that always makes me think of the russians who made a road out of the germans yeah and that shit was 80 years ago well, maybe maybe some of that more rubbed off on the Russians. I'm sure it did. Oh, dude. Because if there was anybody that was getting attacked the most by the Mongols. That's one of the things he talks about in Wrath of Khans that is so great. Or maybe it was in actually in Ghost of the Ostrom where he talks about how the strategies that the Germans used to conquer the Russians were were actually created by the Russian general or the Russian planners 
when they had that secret peace treaty after World War I. And those strategies were influenced heavily by the tactics the Russians learned from fighting the Mongols for a thousand, or for a thousand years. That's great. So it's like the Blitzkrieg is yep. really a legacy of Genghis Khan. <laughs> you think they would have learned that for World War I then? Yeah, but the, they didn't have the weapons the, to know that they couldn't the, the, do those things. The Blitzkrieg was designed to prevent the kind of uh, bogged down stalemate of trench warfare that was so prevalent in the First World War. It was it was all about movement, getting behind right. the enemy's lines, cutting off their supply chain, their communications, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, and then encircling them. Which and, is what Genghis would do with but you, horses. But you couldn't do it with and horses animals. in World War One because of gunpowder and guns. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. another thing that Dan talks about the compound bow, you know, uh, being a weapon system that was not surpassed. Not a compound until, bow. I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, the bows just that they the used. Mongol bow, right? The Mongol bow, right? Um, yeah. uh, was uh, being a weapon system that was not surpassed until basically the invention of gunpowder. But not just the invention of gunpowder, till it was good firearms. Right, right. Like that bow is better than a musket. Yeah, Those things were not is. accurate. A musket – that's why we always think about you know, the Revolutionary War or we think about that time frame, Napoleonic Wars, is they're lining up across from each other and just firing, and it's crazy. It's ridiculous. It is, but those guns, sometimes the safest place to be would be right in front of the barrel. Because they, they yeah. because they the couldn't hit the so broad bad. side of a barn. Yeah, they yeah. weren't rifled barrels. The, the right. powder wasn't – evenly regulated like yeah they weren't very accurate at all the advantage sure. they had is you could give it to somebody and they could fire it within a day whereas that yeah. bow that the mongols had took a lifetime of pulling even now people who hunt with the bow practice all year people yeah. who hunt with the rifle which i do sure get your gun out and shoot it once before season opens to make yeah. sure it's still it's still dialed in yeah. You know, but a bow, you got to be out practicing. You got to build up the muscles, even with these modern compound bows. Sure. You still have to be out practicing, drawing. You have to learn to hold your breath and st or you do all your breathing right and steady. It's way harder than a firearm. But until the firearms got where they were more accurate, more repeatable, and then especially where they had cartridges, that's when the when the Russians and the Chinese were really able – to basically finish the power of the steppe people. Which I, I, I maybe Matt will know. I don't remember which civilization made very ornate bows that took like years to make. I forgot. That's what... the one that's something I was going to mention. He mentions that in this in one of these episodes that them. some of these bows, yeah, could have taken as much as twenty years to make. Mm -hmm. That's generations. Like you have one guy Making yep. a bow for 20 years, teaching his children, teaching a class. This is the most important yep. thing in our society. You know, it's just amazing yep. to pass yep. down. And then you receive it when it's finally done. And it has this history behind it. And you take it in mm -hmm. the battle. And it has this this meaning and this intention and all that. It's soaked with purpose. And then you drop it and a horse steps on it and breaks it. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, think about how <laughs> shitty that is. No. Or and then the next thing I, I actually don't know um, I know the Mongols use swords and daggers. Where the hell did they get them? I mean, did they make their own swords and daggers? Did were they stolen? They, they used I mean, lances and swords, yeah. Right, but so did, uh, they must have had blacksmiths. Uh, well, um, or were they sure trading how, for it? I'm not sure how early they were using them. Um, I'm sure they had blacksmiths mm. and things. Yeah, I think they had their own weapons technology beyond the bow. Uh, well, I mean, I it would have to be hard on the step to have enough That's wood to really have a good forge yeah so i the imagine metal, they were yeah. probably trading for a lot of that probably and then once they start conquering other people they get the engineers and the smiths of, mm -hmm. the, of that culture those cultures yeah right but I, 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 that's not to diminish any achievements by the step people of developing no. their weapon systems yeah so one thing i i've got to talk to you guys about because every time i listen to any of dan Carlin's stuff about the step this idea occurs to me because he talks about how for Thousands of years, there was people coming out of the steppe and being a part of world politics, being a player, right? But since 
you know, the 1600s, it hasn't happened. And my thinking is that's such a small sample size, right? There was probably another there was probably another time where, where the step went like 200 years without people coming out of there affecting world history. Sure. Maybe maybe this is just a little pause, and maybe this o- o- over the long run of history that hasn't changed, or maybe like, the gunpowder really did change it. I like I like technology. to think about that. I think any of us any of us who falls in love with the great conquests of the past wonders why it doesn't still happen. Who's the next Alexander? You know, and you think is that even possible anymore? Given yes. how much the world is connected. Um, what that would look like, you know, you need superior weapons and the and the army behind you. Um, right. Is 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 firepower that much of the great equal or uh, fi- uh, fi- our firearms the that much of the great equalizer to where, you know, uh, what's the so comparison the nowadays of the is, Mongols coming back? <laughs> is that area of the world still so hard to live in that it makes hard men? That can go I conquering. Can, I can't speak I personally. I think I think there's people living out there, you know. I think the reason they were so resurgent uh, throughout history is that they had those leaders like Attila, like Genghis, well, who would bring everybody together and then unite them for a common purpose and then point so them maybe, like an arrow. Maybe that's all they're waiting on is their next Caesar or their next Genghis. It, it's a great man's versus transit forces, right? Because part of it is those people were so hard – that they were going to have a higher percentage chance of making making those those leaders, right? Because they made such a hard their society had to be hard to survive. Hard men, right? hard times make hard men. Hard men make easy times, easy times make soft men and soft men make hard times. Well, in the step you didn't get a lot of soft men. You didn't get a lot of easy times because it was mostly hard times. So you ended up with a higher percentage of hard men that every once in a while would bust out and just rip through everywhere. Well, maybe we're just in one of those little lulls before be. that happens again. I doubt be. it because I think the natural advantages based on geography have been usurped by technology. Yeah, I- I also don't think, and and George and I have talked about this before, but I don't think it would take much to turn, you know, soft men into hard men. I I don't think it would take much. I think it would take, you know, five, maybe five years of hardship. Uh, I don't think the people. You talked about this in an earlier episode of Talking Hardcore, Scott. Yeah, you did. Yeah. But I don't think the people living in the step are, are, are not hard. No, I'm not they saying they're not hard. To... I'm just saying if if it, if push came to shove, we gotta stop using it like that. Though we've what? said that a bunch this episode, they're hard. We got... <laughs> it just sounds bad. <laughs> it sounds bad. Tough. Thank you, Matt. There you go. Tough. <laughs> the people. I don't think that because look at look at the UFC. Yeah. There's a bunch of people from the stand countries that yep. are just. What is the guy who who's the undefeated champ and retired? Because he promised his mom he wouldn't fight anymore. I thought he was Chechnyan. Yeah. Was he Chechnyan? He's yeah, from the steppe. Yeah. yeah. He literally wrestled a freaking bear when he was like eight. Yeah, I forgot his name, but yeah, he's No, Chechnyan. Khabib. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, do you know anything about Khabib? Undefeated, retires from the UFC. Wow. Okay. He, f- he went into the woods and killed a bear at a very young age. That was a thing they had to do there. It's just go out and get a bear. All right. So those people are still there, and they're still really tough. Sure. Because it's still a tough place to live. But, sure. like, horses don't help much against no, they nuclear don't. weapons. Yeah. They don't help much don't. against aircraft carriers or F-22s. Right. So this I kind of out. wraps it. Sorry, go ahead, Matt. Uh, you talk about hard people and and tough people, and one of the, uh, this is, may sound strange, but one of the places that comes to mind is North Korea, right? Oh yeah, uh, oh. hardship. They're yeah. I was That's talking awful. to uh, uh, a, one of my one of my uh, I'm in, at work today. I met uh, I met a guy who I, I saw a sticker in his back window, combat medic, and I was like, oh, it, talking about wow. his, his military experience, and I was like, what was that? Um, he's an older fellow, so I was like, what was that? Uh, 
uh, Gulf War, and he was like, no, this is Cold War. I was uh, on the border of the DMZ with North and South Korea. Wow. And I was like, whoa, man. And he said he said he was on patrol one time, and this North Korean Special Forces guy snuck over, didn't see them, because it's a thing they have to do in the North Korean Special Forces to sneak into the South, steal something, and return, kind of like the Spartans would do. And, wow. and, so, and then he got lit up because he got found by this dude's patrol. And you think about like who's breeding the toughest people in the world. Well, where where is a harder place to live than North right. Korea? But then you think all those people, they're not really well fed or well fueled. Oh. Did you ever listen to that Naomi Park interview on Rogan? Yeah. Yeah. She is. Oh my I've, God. I've I had to, to stop. S- several interviews with her. I'm very familiar with Naomi. I had yeah, to she shut is an it amazing off. Amazing person. Yeah. yeah it's a it very was, hard story it was to listen to. So terrible when they they yeah. took all the dogs they I and mean, then everybody had to forage for crickets well she talked about yeah. seeing a little boy with a hole in his stomach who was dying and feeling no compassion because she was so starved at the time that's the thing they're, and you're like, they're breeding damn. compassion out of these people by hardship yeah which is similar to compassion the, the, is a, the, is a thing that you have the luxury to have when you're well fed and those are the kinds of people when you're starving who can you get that city. luxury yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that's the uh, how how would they be able to do that if they didn't have energy to pull it off? I mean, that's the other thing. That's it. I mean, and I, yeah. Calories. And, 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 yeah. And you're right. You're right, Scott. Yeah. They, there was a, uh, a, a there's another story. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. There, there was like um, there's another story of a person who was in North Korea. And then he she I think it was maybe no, it wasn't because she left when she was too young. Saw one of her friends who had joined the army in the North Korean military or was in the mil- North Korean military mm-hmm. on the streets living as a homeless person, you know, who just got out and he was, he had like, he was just so undernourished. And then we had that, right. um, that defector who came from the army and he, they found a two foot tapeworm in him. Like these people are not well fed. They couldn't run very, they may look good for their little demonstrations that they're doing for Kim Jong Un, you know what I mean? Right. Well, and, the, those, and those people are getting the, the food. Those yeah, people exactly. are the ones getting the food. Exactly right. So, like, I listened to this. Yeah. Um, I've talked about it before, but Michael Malice had that book, The White Pill, which if you haven't read, check it out. He talks about during the the famine in the Ukraine, the Russian Soviet soldiers, excuse me, would know which people were lying and hiding food because they weren't thin enough. Thin enough. Yeah, so sure. they would go to the house. And ransack it till they found the food and beat the shit out of the people. Which is horrible, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what happens in places where that is allowed to happen. Yeah. And that's why that's why it's important to remember that actual civilization and the constitution is worth fighting for. Because absolutely if you don't have good laws and good government, this is where we can end up not that far away and not that hard to get to like these things have happened and are happening now it's true right and the the shit the russians and the germans were doing to each other was 80 years ago in Mm. fact we talked about this this interview i did with my my leslie's grandmother that i'm still editing Mm -hmm. and stuff that was in her lifetime she's 88 what the russians are doing and what the germans were doing was just a part of war in that front. No. Yep. That's not out of us in four generations. Like it's you said, not. Scott, people get hard fast when they have to. Yeah. I, I don't... And if you went through a... I'm sorry. No, well, I mean, it, like, look at the, the, the Great Depression. I mean, you went from the Roaring Twenties to the Great Depression. Yeah. Not everybody was already tough before the Great Depression hit. They had to get tough. You know, True. because you had no choice. You had to survive. So it was all about survival. Yeah. Um, and Dan Dan brings up, I think he uh, he brought up a story about uh, when he covered the Great Depression, about how kids were like fist fighting over, you know, fancy wrapping paper for uh, for fruit or whatever that was being thrown away. Right. They're they using it as like toilet a, paper. Oh, right. Or, right. or, or use corn cobs as, uh, right. as toilet paper. And then COVID <laughs> hits and people go out and buy toilet paper like there's a shortage. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's crazy. Uh, People overbuying is what causes shortages. And, yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> we can anyway, right? And that's yeah, what that yeah. was. It was a, it was a, a weird panic thing, right? But we won't, sure. we don't want to get into that, right? That's not very relative. But stories from the step. 
biggest takeaways it for me well let's go with you matt what's your what's your biggest takeaway from the uh, these uh, well let's just say all the stuff from the step what's your biggest takeaway um that superhuman people can be bred by their environment and that these people that's perfect can be organized into a society that can be unleashed upon the world right so let's take that a step further do you see because i don't think north korea is doing that right they do you see a society on in the world right now that you worry is making superhumans to be unleashed the, the, not the environment but through science yeah china is using crispr to alter the genetics of their of their military if they're That's not they happening. will be no they, right? they are doing that yeah they, they, yeah yeah, they, yeah but yeah. that takes time it does but take the problem time. is and you need to actually have kids to do that and they're not having enough kids yeah there's problems with china all over the place you know yeah <laughs> Yeah. That that one child policy is really biting them in the ass about now. Yeah. Like that <laughs> downstream the, consequences. The basic, the basic basic president for life thing, you know, and their policies that ended up turning cities into ghost towns and you know, you can't vote people out and stuff like that. Right. But they're trying. Yeah. They're they're definitely trying to be that next, you know, elite warrior race. Nope. That's a great point. All right, Scott. Your biggest takeaway of anything step related. Uh, it's better to be a Mongol than anybody else during that time period. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, that's a great point. Uh, I mean, if you, if you had to choose, like, you know, Dan, Dan says all the time, like worst place in history or worst place to be in all of recorded history. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know what? I'd rather go with the best place to be and, uh, you know, <laughs> under Attila or, uh, Genghis yeah. or whatever, probably be a, all right time to be alive. If you were as long there. as you don't mind. Killing and raping and pillaging, and if your soldiers don't do a good job, you got to kill them. Yep. If a guy drops his bowstring and doesn't pick it up, or the neighbor doesn't pick it up, you got to kill ten of them. But you so know as what? long as you're hard enough to do that, then yeah, it's a great place. Well, uh, that's that's the thing though. So your culture shapes who you are. I mean, so you have the nature versus nurture. Okay. So was that all nature? Maybe, probably not. It was all nurtured into the that culture. So, I think it's both. I don't know, because you don't see Mongols running around today doing this kind of stuff. So I'm I'm not really sure right. if, if it's because it takes time to. Well, anyway, I don't think it got bred out. They're still the same people. I feel like it still did though. Uh, <laughs> but because they... because the people who were doing all the breeding weren't the ones killing everybody. Well, okay, so you have uh, you know uh, was it one out of every hundred people are related to direct descendants of of Genghis. Well, you don't see those people running around going crazy. Right. But I've talked about this before on the podcast, I think, but I read this book about uh human DNA and and uh it's called Blueprint and they talk about this is a scientist who studied large sample size studies about people who were given up for adoption and he studied the people and he studied the the parents that gave them up and the adopted parents. And this was like a 30-year study. And he came away from that thinking that it's much more nature than nurture. Much more. I, but that doesn't mean nurture doesn't have any say. It's just heavily favored towards nurture now i feel like there's also a good chance that that sample size or that study works in modern times more than it does back in the day well i've i've known you know a, a number of people that were adopted okay um and uh it, it's I, I think it's a crapshoot because one turned out to be you know, a perfectly yeah, but you're talking about a small sample size. This sure, was, sure. This right. was like thousands and thousands I, I of people. I understand, but it, and just because the, your most parents traits were, heavily you know, correlated much closer to the birth parents than to the adopted parents, like even education <clears throat> level, which you would think would much more correlate to the adopted parents because they would push college and they're they have enough money <clears throat> to adopt a kid. They're probably pushing that, right? Well, that trait tends to correlate much higher to the birth parent than the adopted parent. I don't think that has to, I, I think that has to do with the psychological uh, harms that are done to children when, when they're, 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 they're given up for adoption. Well, some of these kids are adopted and 
you don't even know if they know. Uh, okay, right? it would have That's to be thing, infancy. Right? And he's controlling for these things. So at infancy? I think I think in a lot of cases he's controlling for those though. Gotcha. You have to check the study out, and I'm I'm sure there's, I'm I'm sure it's not a hundred percent, but I do think that at least in a modern society where we have all these other things in place that kind of limit the cultural influence, right? Now, you go back to the Spartans, you go back to the Mongols, the cultural influence is so much stronger than it is now. Yeah. Right? Because if you don't do those things, you get you get murked. Yeah. Right? There's a difference there. So now the culture influences are more tame, so maybe it's more nurture or more nature. But back then it might have been more nurture. Yep. Now I got to remember what my takeaway was. Damn it. <laughs> you came up with such a fun topic for me. I love talking about that. Then I had a good I had the, I had a good one, damn it. All right. So just think about it for a minute. Okay. While I'm thinking about that, Matt, what are you reading or listening to right now? Uh, Matt, we can't hear you. We lost your audio, bud. Uh, sorry, I, uh, I I cleared my throat and forgot to unmute it. Um, no I, actually, the next book I think I might read is that I, I was about to plug this for the benefit of Dr. Uh, Harl, uh, Empires mm -hmm. of the Steps, A History of the Nomadic Tribes Who Shaped Civilization. Yeah, I think I might I read a, that too. I have an audible credit. There's an audio book. I might start that very soon. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I have an audible credit as well. Yeah. How's your book coming? It's coming. Uh, so Pax Humana has finished a new one. I'm making progress. Uh, a few thousand words in the last few days. I found some cool themes to explore. Um, I am working history into it in that it is a civilization where history is being altered, controlled, and um, and ch and changed. And uh, people like 1984 are attempting... style. Yeah, yeah, 1984 style. But it it is by the controlling power in the civilization, and people mm -hmm. are attempting to learn the true history of the race. And what I've really found is that, uh, okay, so they say history, you know, is a consensus of sources, right? You know, uh, here, I'm sorry, they say history is written by the, the victors. Uh, well, history is also passed down father to son, mother and daughter through oral tradition, and that's a much more pure form of passing down history. But you have to think about the intention of those who are passing down history. And that's what I'm trying to focus on with this book. Hey, I think that sounds fascinating, man. What? Well, yeah, you you even have physical evidence of that one. Leslie's grandfather's book. Right. Like I talked about in the last episode, he, my wife's grandfather, when he retired, he was a big wig, worked his way up at I think it was GM. Real smart guy. He spent the next 20 years going around the country writing a genealogy book and writing a personal memoir about his time as a merchant marine. Wow. Never intending to publish, right? Never intending to publish it. Made 10 copies of the Merchant Marine book. He made 10 copies, sent one to the Merchant Marine Museum, a hall, uh, uh, museum. Okay. And then the rest of them went to family members. Same. Wow. And then he did this family warriors book that started with 1066, went back 30 generations of warriors in their family and tracked them through every major war in the Anglo-Saxon sphere since then. Again, never intending to publish just so his grandkids and his great grandkids and his, their their kids would be able to read that. That's amazing. There's no way in hell I would do that. <laughs> Like I, I I find history fascinating and I love it, but man, nobody's paying you. Like I said last time, I would just go fishing. Yeah. Like that's <laughs> cool. I'm so glad he did that because that's, that's a legacy for my kids. Sure. You know, that's, that's, that's half their, half their DNA is a descendant from him. So I think it's cool. And that's why I like doing this history podcast, but, Step store, step store is biggest takeaway, George. Yeah, I had a good one. Oh, <laughs> let me look at my notes. Sorry, I'm right, so... trying to remember what the hell it was. Oh, one thing that this isn't. Do do. Okay, doo. so <clears throat> two interesting tidbits from the uh, hardcore addendum episode. One, Attila had secretaries that spoke Greek and Roman. 
How fascinating is that? And Matt, I think your mic's off again. Sorry, that's a weird control. No problem. Yeah, that is that is fascinating because uh, that just shows his savvy that he mm -hmm. wanted to be able to communicate with the rulers of other people. And so it, not and, very and barbaric. No, not very barbaric, no. Well, it might have been barbaric. It might have been threatening letters. You don't know. But my point is, <laughs> you better give he me some money just, or we're coming over. He, he, he knew enough to know <laughs> that there were other languages that he needed to be able to deal with. Yep. Sure. They weren't savages like you would think of as savages because there really weren't any savages that you would think of as savages unless maybe you're talking about ancient, ancient humans encountering Neanderthals. And even sure. they probably could communicate and maybe Neanderthals could even learn the language of the humans because they were able to communicate enough that they bred. Yeah. Oh, you know, and remember, it probably wasn't yeah. all rape. No, let's remember the Attila was the genius who mobilized that, organized that society. So he was he was a step right. above the the, the cut, you know, the normal. Right, folk. and that's a great point. It's not like the whole society was that, but man, that's interesting to me. Well, they were also it sending is. emissaries. You know, even you know, mm -hmm. back to Genghis, right. they were sending emissaries. You know, to talk to the Great Khan, or or maybe they didn't even know him as the Great Khan. Um, but it was still, they would send emissaries to him. But then, how do you? I, I think uh, I think it's Wrath of the Cons where something had to be translated like four or five times, yeah. horribly translated four or five times oh, just to get, you know, the, the, was, the, yeah, uh, the letter from the Pope. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And by the time I got to him, it was just gibberish. What else you got there, George? I think it was not gibberish by the time it got to him because they went back to the Vatican and saw the original letter, and it was gibberish from the jump. <laughs> they wrote, they wrote a letter. Somebody yeah. explain the Trinity to me, Trinity to me right now, and, and make it make sense. Right, <laughs> and I know people that could. Yeah, sure. But th but that yeah. letter sure didn't. Right. <laughs> so one thing that I thought was interesting that he talked about, in Kenneth talked about in the podcast with Dan in the addendum episode, is while he got into why history is important to study. Okay. And his theory, what, or what he suggested, and this is something that I think we probably all agree with, but hey, let's preach to the choir. You study history because it allows us to understand the present and prepare for the future. Mm. Because human nature doesn't change. We just forget. We forget or we never knew. But it doesn't change. So by studying history, it gives us more insight into human nature which then allows us to prepare for a future dealing with those same humans. I think we forget. Right. Because if you asked a 23-year-old now um, the horrors of the Eastern Front, they would have no idea. But that's not forget. They just don't know it. Or the horrors of the Holocaust. But they were never taught it. Uh, the Holocaust, that yes. The Holocaust, old, yes. But they were taught it. If you're Sorry, asking ahead, a 23, 23 year old uh, Ukrainian uh, person, they might have a very clear idea right. of what the horrors of the Eastern Front were like. Right. Oh, for sure. Exactly. We're far removed. And same with the Holocaust. But you're asking a 22 year old to what they know about the Holocaust, which they learned about when they were what 12 to 14 years old. Yeah. Right. Think about think about what is happening to them physically at that age. And we're expecting them to remember things that really probably to the average person don't feel that important. Okay. Well, what about the horrors of, you know, you could say the Civil War or World War One. Same thing. Bella Wood. Same thing. When you're, when you're in history class when you're 12 or 13 or 16, most people are probably thinking about the person of the opposite sex next, sitting next to him that looks good. No, I disagree. They're they're more worried about the Kardashians than they are with anything also, else. Also, that is human nature. Uh, Why are the Kardashians important to people? Because it triggers certain hormonic responses in some people and, other, and, and, and even in the women because that's an evolved trait too. The study of history – is only going to be interesting to the people who have that genetic predisposition in the first place. And that's not going to be everybody. Sure. 
Okay. It, I'm going to tell you this story, guys. I'm going to tell you this story. No, you have to tell us your takeaway. From- I'm going to tell you this story, and you're not allowed to tell my wife. She's going to hear it. <laughs> She's never watching this, so She's it should be okay. But we went and seen Oppenheimer, and afterwards she was like, Did we bomb the Japanese? Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> and I looked her in the eyes and I said, I love you. <laughs> the oh fact God. that you are so detached from world politics oh and all of that stuff, it's That's perfect okay. for me. Yeah. It's perfect for me. Yeah, right. Because I'm into it too much. If she was into it, we'd right. be talking about it nonstop <laughs> and nothing would get done. Out. One. Yeah. And she would be way more anxious in the first place if she was thinking about nuclear weapons and shit because she already has an anxious personality anyway when she's thinking about germs and the kids going to school. If she's thinking about nuclear weapons, we're screwed. (laughs) So I am so happy that she didn't remember that. But I know she got taught that in school. Maybe. I I know she did. But it it didn't stick because you're so self-absorbed at that age. Hmm. You are. And that's by evolution, right? You're worried more about all the stuff that's happening in your normal life. You're not worried about the stuff that happened 50, 100, now, or 2,000 years ago. Now, again, folks, ago. this is American society that we're talking about. If yeah. you live in Japan, no one forgets that the Americans bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If you live Great in point. If you live in Germany, no one forgets that the Allies firebombed Dresden. Like you're living oh, we with also firebombed all Tokyo. Don't yeah, the Japanese yeah. don't tend to hold it against Americans. The, the it's not, Nagasaki it's not about holding and against Hiroshima. It. It's about it's about these remember. events being of cultural significance and therefore important to the youth, the way the Kardashians are to American right. children. Right, and America really has a short attention span and memory for history compared to because other countries we go places we wage war we usually win and then we come home to a clean unsullied civilization that's a great point and that's a geography thing we're lucky it is with yeah i mean it's pretty lucky where we're at and that's a good point we don't wage war on american soil and haven't realistically i mean you can count pearl harbor and in, I, I, in, I was going to say in Pearl the Pacific. Harbor. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but so if you grew up in yeah, not the thought, continental yeah. United right. States, the Mexican right. American War. Right. And that's the 1830s, okay. dude. Yep. Right. No. No. The, the Mexican American War was the 1830s. I think if you're a yeah. Hispanic person living down in that area, you still, you know, very much in, are bare, Maybe. been taught by your family that, you know, this Maybe. was our land. And, and, of course, there's the Native Americans who look around you and see nothing but colonizers. So, yeah. Right. Some of them do. But yeah. not all of them. Not all of them. Right. Not all of them. And not all of them should. <laughs> it's important to remember that the Native Americans that the, the Americans took the land from took it from someone else. And they not took all, it from someone else. Not, not oh, all some, of them. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah but so, but there was, I there mean, was fun. who were the first ones over the Bering Strait? You know, and like, the fact the is, ones? this is something I've been thinking about lately, right? The dates that the people came over from the Bering Strait now has been pushed back like 20,000 years ago, roughly. Yeah, right. Right. And we talk about the people over here. Here we call them Native American. Well, that's obviously a misnomer. Right. If we're talking about humans... The only place we're really native, as far as we know right now, is yeah. Africa. I, I say so, indigenous or first nation. But it wouldn't be indigenous either because, again, that would be Africa. Right. And so indigenous, in Canada, they yeah, say first yeah. peoples. First right? nation, yeah, first nation. Yeah. First nation. It, it, but we it, don't it, even it. know if that's true because 20,000 years ago, some people might have came over. <laughs> and then they got wiped out. And then the next people over, so they might have right. no descendants left. So we don't know. So what we should call them is people here before us. Yeah, or no, that's not true, us because yeah. we're, we're, we're not related right. to the people. I mean, people here before European contact. That's here, really what we should say if we're trying to be accurate. Here, here's the is, way I, I, I see it. And, and whatever political or cultural or societal conclusions or classifications can be made from this, once upon a time, humans branched out. We went out of Africa, we went up on the coastline, India, all right. that kind of stuff, and then we kind of stayed there, and some of us kept going through the north, we, you know, became Eskimos, and at a certain point in time, there was a parting where we said, farewell, brothers and sisters, we will see you on the other side of the world, what stories we will tell, 
our children will play together and we will be reunited as a family. Columbus, the Native Americans, that were the, the, the First Nation people, that was that happening. And we just freaking killed each other. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's, it was it's more not disease as, that, that wiped out. And it's I mean, not as simple as that unless either. Unless you want to talk about Cortez. That Cortez did actually come over to, to Cor Cortez to was on a mission. There was some assholes. And he very much succeeded. 80 to Let's 90% not percent. Of, all, of all people who were here were wiped out by smallpox. Yeah, but it, it was not a friendly reunion because we didn't remember that history, that parting. It didn't matter to us. We were well, and it was never it. It so, passed down. I think that's an interesting way to look at it, but – I also don't think it was a really a parting. The Bering Strait, the Bering Land Bridge was like 600 miles across. Whole generations of people lived on that bridge without so knowing imagine. they were going anywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, they were slowly just, just exp they were doing yeah. what humans always do. Move sure. to a different spot. To and find frankly, more forward. that's yeah. what yep. Columbus was doing too. Or he was of, doing what humans always do, and a lot of times it's nasty and mean, and then a lot of times it's not. And if we can a lot of times the, they can meet the people and be nice and get along until shit gets bad, and then we fight. But and, a lot of times what, it's bad what, too. Let's look at it like the way uh, Homo sapiens encountered ne Neanderthals, right? Did we get along with them and say, oh, brothers, long-lost cousins? No, they probably fought a lot too claiming right. land it's as old as time and there's they fought no real, yeah there's no real moral superiority to be had i mean exactly we, the, the story of columbus uh and the conquest of the look North at the aztecs more... right columbus what happened with the with the with the conquistadors there was some terrible stuff right but does any of it sound as bad as what the aztecs would do no uh, to their own people uh, to their own people to their well don't forget their own people to They'd have you say their own people, but they probably didn't see it as their own people. They saw it as people they conquered. Sure. So we're seeing it as their own people, but they probably saw them as the other until the white people came and they're like, oh, maybe they're the other. Yeah. yeah. But they still have human sacrifices. Yeah. Like they no. rip out the, the heart out of it anyway. What is it? The, the temple in Mexico City, they're saying the, the records that they said – and. I, this is what I'm trying to remember, but it was something like 50,000 people they they sacrificed to, to break in that temple, and that's the year before Cortez. It was just like to commemorate a building. <laughs> yeah, they're like, <laughs> this we build is so sweet, <laughs> we got to kill 50,000 people. Nowadays, we've got that down to a bottle of champagne. We're doing pretty good. That's yeah. Ford yeah, Field. Right that's now. the <laughs> average football stadium by your house. For yeah. that day, sure. we're going to sacrifice all of them. Yeah. Cut their hearts out, throw them in a volcano. Mm. That's insane. But, but it is. That's also in humans. That was also happening in uh, what was it? Uh, uh, where Hannibal was from, right? Carthage. They had they had what well, they would sacrifice their kids. Yeah. Yeah. Carthage. And, yeah. Carthage. There's a little there's a little Thanks. bit of ambiguity about that, but I think heavily the side comes down on it was actually happening. So yeah. Right. And well. That probably made sense because if it got hard, you're like, well, maybe we got to appease the God. But it's really like stop wasting calories on these little inept bastards and have <laughs> the more food. That's the way you would see it if you were starving and your neighbor had six kids. Well, look, and you're like, hey, jerk, there's not enough food. Well, look Why don't you the, sacrifice some of those kids? Well, look at the Romans <laughs> and then throwing, throwing kids down in the, uh, in the sewers. I mean, when Dan, I think Dan brings that up. I don't uh, remember that, but yeah. yeah, I'm sure they did. Humans do amazing and beautiful things for each other and awful things because yeah. it's nuance. But yeah. back to stories from the step. I asked uh -huh. Matt what he was reading lately. He's going to read Ken's book based on the addendum. Scott, what are you reading? I'm reading The Fourth Turning. Fourth yeah, Turning the fourth is here. Fourth Turning is here. Yep. Nice. Uh, I'm still waiting on the, the next Dungeon Crawler Carl to come out. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm just, it, I just, it's funny to, it's funny to want to listen to. It's actually mm -hmm. absolutely absurd. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, that's always fun. And, uh, what was the other one I was reading? Oh, um, every once in a while I'll pop back over to the rest is history. And, uh, I'm really, really fascinated with the Atlantis cup podcast they have on there. I think it was, uh, so that's worth checking out. It's worth it. I mean, I, I think it's interesting. Oh, I so, love that stuff. I, mean, I just haven't but, got to it. I put that higher on my list. 
Um, but the fourth turning was one that also I'm really trying to power through. It's just it's long and it's difficult on an audiobook format, but it's worth hmm. it. I, hmm. I don't want to I don't want to knock anybody, but the the only thing that makes that book difficult is the monotone voice. Oh, <laughs> so, I don't mind it. It's, it's just, That's funny because it's the author reading it, right? Yeah, uh, which is a yeah. which is a risk. I I talked about Michael Malice's The White Pill, right? And th- you think the fourth turning is here is bad? I will play some <laughs> Michael Malice's White Pill. That's a Russian guy reading it. <laughs> well, at least I have no, no, but no Russian accent, to. no good accent. Oh, he's just no emotion the whole time. So kind of like Lex he barely Brayton. takes a that's pause. Like, that's like listening to Lex. Well, worse. For me. No, Lex. Well, Brayton's worse. Dry. No, I'm telling you. I liked the white pill so much, and I was like, man, if anybody else would have read this like that was trained, it would have been so good. But the <laughs> audiobook is so bad, <laughs> but I like the book a lot anyway. And we're not we're not knocking any authors, by the way. We we love. No, it's just some we, people need to hire voice actors and yeah. not I, do it I, themselves. I have, an, I, have an, I have a funny example of that myself. Uh, I read a book about the Unabomber, and it was written by a, um, an FBI agent who was actually part of the case and was there when he was arrested, and she mm-hmm. was just so enthusiastic to be reading her book it was just the most re- the craziest narration so it's it off the wall the other way yeah she, yeah she was like and I, this happened it was just like lady simmer down like just read right. the, read the, yeah. it, it, it distracts from the topic just like exactly. when it's too totally flat right. exactly either yeah. way it can pull away yeah george what, are you what reading, is george? your takeaway from the step stories no we got to that i no I, you didn't i can't remember the thought i had but damn it it was good Okay. It was like life changingly good. We're gonna leave well, you guys put, with that. It, I, I it, had a it. genius thought and it's gone because I listened to you guys talk too much. So and thanks we had, guys. We had better genius thoughts, Matt. I'm sure That's you what did. it was. George, I'm George, sure you, can, you did. You can put it in the server and this might be a good time to allow me to plug the server. Yeah. Discord server. The link will be in the description. Also a link to the addendum episode will be in the description and a link to uh Kenneth Harrell's book will be in the description. Um, if you want to continue is, the conversation with us all and some other people who are yes, if you about history re- like us, listen to this and you want to talk to us yeah. about dumb shit we said or smart stuff we said or anything, anything we said, go to the Discord because we love talking about it and we'll answer your questions. Most of you it's probably. Called, uh, sorry, go ahead. It, it's it, it's called hardcore history history discussion. Right. And and then there's a separate discussion set up for talking hardcore. You can put it in either one of those discussions and you'll be able to 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 uh to talk to us about it and we'd love it. And look for Matt's work. He has some free uh segments of his new book Paximana that are already done by professional voice actors that you can go listen to and they're really good. And you can also Thanks, find man. his work uh Matt, we got to have you on to talk about your book that you self-published about the serial killer. Oh, yeah. Um, but let's leave more, it. Let's tease okay. it. Let's I'll, tease I'll it. Let's that. just leave it there. All Matt right. self-published, a, self-published a book where he talked to a serial killer. <laughs> Thanks for t- watching. Have a good night. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Have a good one. Matt, don't Thank turn that guys. off. Don't turn you it off. It.